Welcome everybody who's come in on to this call. Uh, this is uh, CPS Energy in San Antonio's housing disaster. Uh, we do have a Spanish translation. Uh, you'll see at the bottom of your panel, uh, I, uh, you can select either English or Spanish. Um, so please uh, check in there. Uh, we are recording this call as well, so be aware of that. Uh, we're going to be archiving this um, as part of an ongoing conversation in the community. Uh, we'll use the chat function. Uh, so, and we will try to uh, to stop for some questions along the way. But um, I would say uh, if you want to uh, comment, uh, get into the the chat window to comment there. Now, uh, the purpose of this is kind of uh, within uh, San Antonio, we've had an ongoing conversation within many of the um, climate justice community organizations um, that have been dedicated to uh, initially exploring what energy justice can contribute to uh, to uh, a recovery uh, in the in the COVID in the COVID nineteen era, right? So this dates back into uh, twenty twenty, uh, and um, we began. We we were asking just like, well, what do these principles mean for for a city? Uh, and then we put out some recommendations in October, uh, and then you know when when you, when winter storm Yuri hit, uh, it kind of just added on another layer of uh, need for, for, for us. Uh, and I'm going to put up, for those who aren't familiar, uh, some of our key recommendations um, involved, you know, one, ending the disconnections for, for, for families, um, well, permanently ending disconnections as a policy for those at or below 200% of the federal poverty uh, line. Uh, second to that uh, would be the elevating conservation as a strategy for uh, as, a, as a tool for, for COVID-19 recovery. And we're gonna talk a lot about, that's the heart of this call. Uh, and that's what we're gonna be talking about here. Uh, we, we uh, our third point and, and recommendation was for no rate increases to be passed by the council until those rates are fair. Uh, a community uh, driven resource planning project. So the whole conversation around generation decisions that we all needed to be at the table together. Uh, and then the last one being shutting down sp spruce by 2030. Uh, and so I just wanted to put those up. And this call is the second of two that we've had. This one is dedicated to that second point, uh, conservation as a tool of recovery. And we all lived through this, or most of those on this call lived through this experience where in the, you know, the storm rolls in, this polar vortex, you know, you know, breaks through the the, the Gulf, the, the jet stream rather. And there's 4 million people around the state who are out of power. In San Antonio, that's 400, uh, nearly 400,000 people. Uh, and, and, and all these investigations have gotten underway and people are talking about, you know, where, where to lay the blame. And um, one thing we know is that this, this is a call for radical, uh, for a radical response and reform of a system that is clearly broken. Um, COVID-19, folks will probably remember that our elected leadership, you know, started talking about, you know, pre-existing, kind of like San Antonio's pre-existing conditions, right, which was inequity and racism, racist policy setting and, and, and growth and, and intentional development that excluded large parts of the city. And so there was a lot of conversation uh, when COVID hit about like, you know, what made us so vulnerable to this and who was bearing the, the brunt of that. Uh, and then a promise, right, from our council and our mayor that we weren't going back to that world. Well, now Yuri comes and what I'm hearing people talk about is we need to build back better, you know, build back better becomes uh, kind of like a, a mantra almost. And yet, where we're talking about generation issues, it's uh, where that's happening, a lot of it's around weatherizing existing fossil fuel infrastructure or building new gas infrastructure. Uh, and we're totally overlooking what most of the utility world knows as the first fuel, which is conservation and energy efficiency. And it seems like in San Antonio, if we're looking at something that 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 one, well, one, it makes sense economically and all and all the rest. But if we're looking at a recovery mechanism, uh, if you want to build back, truly build back better, you're going to be asking questions about public health, right? Of those energy of energy choices, we're going to be asking about bills and bill reduction and fair rates. We're going to be asking about keeping how do we keep people secure in their homes in periods of disaster, and and obviously one thing that we have learned is is that 
same as with COVID, there are particular populations that are as, uh, more at risk and more vulnerable. And we've, we've learned or been reminded in this case that, that at a very fundamental level, uh, housing uh, is a matter of life and death for folks. Um, so we've kind of expected more from San Antonio, uh, but we're already hearing uh, from CPS Energy that, you know, that they're talking about slowing the rollout of renewable energy, uh, about um, uh, building out more gas, rather than this conversation about uh, conservation and renewables. Um, now, housing is a big field, and I don't want to say that we're speaking to, to all, of, all of this at once. Um, but I, you know, there's, there's, you know, the evictions, you know, and, and is, is huge. Uh, we're not getting into kind of like public housing um, uh, struggles in San Antonio or uh, Colonias. We're really looking, we're thinking of housing in terms of as, as kind of like, yeah, as, as, as a shelter, you know, what a shelter should be uh, in a period of, of extreme weather and, and particularly as it intersects with, with energy. Uh, and so we've got a few speakers coming up. Uh, top of this is uh, our translator, Seba Li, who is a, an advocate, who is an artist, who's a musician, and just an all around kind of tremendous force here in San Antonio. Uh, and so if, again, if you're just coming in down at the bottom of the, the screen, you can find um, a, uh, a translation button. If you need Spanish translation, it's there at the bottom of the screen. Ralph Garcia, I'm sorry, I'm speaking really fast, Seba. I'm gonna take a breath. Ralph Garcia is a, an advocate, a disability rights advocate uh, who was personally uh, impacted by this storm like most of us were, but at a, a pretty unique, a pretty unique way and has been telling his story uh, and continues to tell his story on behalf of uh, a broad part of the population of San Antonio and one that doesn't often uh, get the attention or the visibility in the media. Um, and lastly, Adam Jacobs is, is sort of uh, the keynote, if you were, uh, will he's be presenting and, and we've been working with Adams, uh, 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 Jacobs with uh, Optimal Energy uh, since uh, 2019, uh, dissecting these programs as they exist as CPS Energy programs to, to weatherize homes, uh, the free weatherization program programs that target kind of working communities as well as you know, big businesses. Um, and so that's kind of like the, the lineup that we have here. Um, I will say that uh, this is sort of like a, um, a uh, 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 we're gonna get into some technical language but we wanna try not, not to go too far. Uh, what we really wanna emphasize here is uh, conservation efficiency as the first fuel, as the one that actually doesn't cost, the one that just <laughs> out the gate is saving you money because we're not building things, right? We're, 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 we're not burning things and that's what the essence of conservation uh, is. Um, but STEP itself, for those who aren't familiar, STEP is kind of like an umbrella within CPS uh, that, uh, that where you will find, you know, these, like we talk about weatherization programs, uh, where you will find um, smart meters or smart thermostats, where you're able to manage your power use remotely, or the utility is able to dial back your use remotely. Um, programs that work for schools improve heating or cooling. Um, programs that, well, included in step would be uh, rooftop solar rebates or free solar programs that people can rent their rooftops to uh, CPS. Uh, and so that's when we talk about STEP, when we talk about Flex Step, that's the program we're talking about. And I do wanna emphasize that, that we like these programs, right? Uh, and so we're not, we're about seeing more of them. And I think what, has been disheartening is um, that re more recently on the first, I guess it was that that CPS put out a, a bid, uh, a request for it's called a request for proposals to the market, saying we want to do continue this program. Um, they're not improving it um, by very much, uh, and 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 our thought was on the other side of Yuri that we needed to have a collective like sit down. Uh, and, and really think this through that, I mean, it's, it's what we've been doing is not nearly enough. Um, and so we need to look for a realistic, ag aggressive program uh, that will, will save lives, right? Um, and so we need to go harder 
uh, and, 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 and stronger with this. There is a, a trust issue uh, here uh, in San Antonio for those who have worked um, on utility uh, work here. Um, uh, there were recently two petition efforts um, to reform CPS and re re reform our San Antonio water system as well. Uh, and, and in both cases, uh, the utilities, city-owned utilities sued or uh, used legal mechanisms to kind of like get out of publicly driven um, efforts to change their, their governance and the way, the way they function. And in essence, what they did in these cases was to say um, that what matters first for them uh, is the, the the people who are holding their debt right, um, and rather than the people of San Antonio who 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 own these um, utilities. So I do want to point out this has been an ongoing conversation, not just around conservation programs, whether they work or, or don't work, or how they did or they didn't work in this storm, um, but now debt. There's a billion dollars that San, San Antonio is on the the line for, and so this is our CEO at CPS. Um, uh, at their most recent meeting saying, this is the beauty of municipal power. Municipal power doesn't leave customers struggling to think about their individual bills. We're coming up with a plan to address this issue. And so this issue in this case is that billion dollars um, and other utilities are, you know, it's already, you know, uh, uh, at risk of, of passing through. There's a lot of conversation at a state level. Um, but there's just not a level of trust here in San Antonio because of what we saw in response from the utility uh, in, in, in these, in, with these uh, petitions. So uh, if you are interested, I, I flashed up earlier these, these kind of like five uh, areas that, that, that the coalition is working with. Um, the, the, the first one being the cutoffs. Debt is a big part of that. So we're expecting that we're going to be expanding our, uh, our demand demand from the city, from the utility to look at debt forgiveness programs. Um, and because people are coming through with a lot, with a lot of debt, even if they, if, if the utility has been prevented from shutting off power, um, this is going to be a serious, uh, a serious issue. Uh, and so I will just remind folks, uh, again, uh, do, um, use the chat. We're going to be watching here in the chat for questions. Uh, I'm going to pass my uh, pass this over to Ralph in just one second. Um, I I met Ralph several years ago. Uh, what I and and hadn't realized we were talking right before this call um, that that he has had uh, uh, and he'll describe better his 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 situation. But someone as someone who's reliant upon electricity for uh, for for survival in a very very direct way um, had his uh, power turned off three times I'm now learning, uh, despite the fact that he's been listed with CPS's critical care program. When I heard, first heard that, I thought that critical care program must mean, you know, that you know, we're aware that you, you, are, you rely upon medical devices um, for your, your well-being, for survival, uh, and therefore, you know, there's no, there's no cutoff policy and that's not what it is. So he's gonna describe a little bit more what that is. And, uh, and again, I'm just really appreciative for folks who have come in. I'm going to pass to Ralph uh, Garcia now, and uh, and then after Ralph, I'll introduce uh, Adam, and and we'll just be building up kind of questions as we go. Uh, Ralph, if you'll turn your video and your mic on, I'm going to pass it to you. Thanks. Hi. So, um, hello everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Ralph Garcia, and um, 25 years old. And I have uh, what's called spinal muscular atrophy. It's a form of muscular dystrophy. And uh, it was a condition that I was born with. It's genetic. And unfortunately, it's a terminal uh, condition. And a lot of secondary diagnosis, if you will, uh, go along with that. When I was diagnosed, there was multiple things going on you know i was diagnosed at the age of four years old and it, it kind of fell into a routine of if it's not one thing it's another 
and living with a disability comes with its own challenges, as you can imagine. When being confined to a wheelchair, to, you know, not being able to uh, cut up your own food or dress, dress yourself, it becomes very challenging. And uh, it's very difficult, as you can imagine, uh, emotionally, physically, and uh, can even have a you know, mental factor into it. So as I was getting older, my condition progressed uh, due to its nature. And what ended up happening was I started to develop problems uh, with my lungs, respiratory problems. So these respiratory problems require uh, constant machines, you know, um, machines, th the best way I can describe it is nebulizer machines to, uh, that take medications to open up the airway, as well as uh, other machines to help me breathe, uh, like a ventilator and uh, a CPT uh, percussor, which uh, loosens any junk that calcifies into the lungs. So what, as you can imagine, it's a challenge. And so these machines not only sustain life, but they increase the quality of life and for patients like myself. And so when that happens, it becomes a bit easier, but they all have one common factor and that's power. You need power to sustain these machines. And without them, life can not only turn into a survival situation for you, but it becomes very difficult and it can be life-threatening. So when it comes to Yuri, uh, as you can imagine, we here in San Antonio and Texas, we went through a horrible time uh, recently. And what ended up happening was due to negligence and uh, pre uh, failure to prepare for these types of situations. We ended up going into one of our, the, no pun intended, darkest periods that the state has ever faced. <clears throat> it not only left uh, people uh, left in the dark, struggling to stay warm, but it left patients in the disabled community, in the elderly community, fighting to survive. When we face these situations, it not only puts a mental strain and emotional strain on people like myself, but it becomes something that you have to question, what's next? When it came to me, um, it became very personal. So I I've had my power cut off uh, three times in, in the past. Um, this was the third time. And what ended up happening was my, um, my mother, who takes care of me, uh, she has always fought for me. She has always fought for, you know, my well-being, my care, as a lot of parents of a disabled child, you know, um, are. They, they fight for their child and they advocate for their child, no matter how old or young they are. So what you don't see these days is parents, if you're watching this, you know that being a parent, you want to do anything for your child. But my mother is also disabled. She has epilepsy and she's a cancer survivor. So it's been rough to say the least. You grow up and you're facing these challenges uh, with with the disabled mom and her child is disabled. And 
you're at the poverty line because um, due to that disability. When it comes to challenging efforts, you know, we face it every day, but we find a routine and we get a hold of the routine. But we rely on people to help us, doctors, nurses, therapists, physical therapists, occupational uh, therapists, and even speech therapists. And nursing services, if you will, provider services, all these services. <clears throat> they have their own uh, issues, if you will. <clears throat> but I'm here to speak on CPS uh, energy. So CPS Energy has a what's called a critical care program. It's a program that is not advertised. It's not advertised. It's mm -hmm. not well known. And it's quote unquote a program to help the disabled. Now. Personally, I don't think it is. It's a program that helps protect a PR, if you will. It, it's something that quote, benefits the image of a company that fails to act and protect their disabled community. <laughs> Under the critical care program, I have been, I've had my power cut off three times. The first two times they cut it off because due to a factor in that we did not renew our that program. There was no call. There was no, hey, it's time to renew. Let's get you back on it. Let's protect you. Uh, let's have you. No, there is an expiration date. And that, and you have to continuously uh, call them uh, CPS Energy and request when the expiration date is. Now, if you don't call, they will kick you off and uh, take your name off the, their list. When that happens, you are eligible for disconnection. Now that benefits nobody. And what ends up happening is patients like myself are cut off and the emotional factor is hard. I've had the second time that I was cut off was in July, 2020. And when that happened, it was very, devastating. I was asleep on my ventilator and all of a sudden it shut down. Me, when that happens, it damaged my lungs. It harms me because in the middle it's breathing for me and the best way I can describe it was it was like a train hit my chest. And you're not able to breathe. You're trying not to go into shock. And you finally catch your breath. You take off your machine. You figure out what's going on. Nothing's working. I have found myself in that situation two times in the past. And you run into that factor that it's not okay. Your life is not a game to be played with. It shouldn't be a game to play with. And it took all my efforts all my mom's efforts for us together to fight to get our power, to get back on that list. 
And it's a continued fight that doesn't go away. There's no reassurance. Now, when Storm Yuri hit, it was very difficult because an average blackout, you think, oh, it's an hour, two hours tops. I'll be fine. But when this occurred, the lights, when they switched off, I was talking to my mother. And a lot of people don't know what it's like to talk to your mother about the day, about the plans for the evening, getting excited because they're planning a birthday party or a birthday dinner, and then just seeing how each other's doing. And having that conversation. And then the power cuts off. And because the power cuts off, it triggers a seizure in your parent. And being physically disabled, you're unable to help them. And you know she's going through this. And yet she tells you in the midst of going through these things, she manages to find the strength to say, well, it's going to be okay. We're going to be okay. God will protect us. We'll find a way. And you can't let the emotions get the best of you. You have to continue to handle the situation. When five minutes were up and she was able to gather herself, there was no time for rest. There was no time to think you had to jump into action. My nebulizer doesn't work. My cough assist machine doesn't work. My percussor and suction machines for mucus don't work because they need power. And all you have is a six hour backer battery on a ventilator and an inhaler and an inhaler to rely on. I didn't have time to cry. I didn't have time to mope. I had to be strong and I had to fight. Just like many of the disabled community had to fight. So what ends up happening? I work with my mom. We get as many comforters as we could. We take them to the warmest place in my apartment, which is my, my room. We put cush uh, sofa cushions on the floor, spreading them out pillows around there to isolate. And then you put sheets, you put comforters over that to make sure that she's warm. What do you do next? You look to your right and you insulate the windows with towels. You put the heaviest comforter that you can find and hang it over the window. Then you put a sheet over that. You put on as many clothes as you can. And then you insulate the door. You put towels at the doorway. Then you shut the door, make sure it's sealed tight. Then you put a sheet over that door to insulate any leaking 
of corn there. All that. And you have one flashlight to work with. You have half a can of peanut butter, half a loaf of bread, and you say a prayer that you don't still manage to stay alive. A critical care program did not protect me. When I called CPS Energy, what did they tell me? They told me one simple thing. They answered with an automated voice messaging system, not a person. From there, you fought, fought to stay warm, fought to stay alive. I knew I couldn't use my ventilator because I knew if I did, it would eventually die. And I didn't know how long I was going to be without that. I remember laying in my bed, struggling to breathe, but telling myself, Ralph, you got to keep calm. You got to stay alive. I was afraid that I would close my eyes. And if I woke up, would my mother still be with me? Nobody should have to go through that. And then when you think all is said and done, when you think it's going to be okay, what ends up happening? CPS energy turns on the power for 45 minutes, getting your hopes up. And you thank God that you're able to use your machines again. But that cuts off the power again. There's no assistance or programs to get solar power energy generators to patients or help them get equipment to sustain those machines if you need it. There's no answer to this. But it's a ma matter of morals. Are you going to protect a person's well-being. You can't outweigh a person's life with money. It shouldn't have to come to that. We need resources, especially with the disabled community and elderly community that's been crying out for help for years. No person should have to go through that. It's wrong. It doesn't matter your beliefs. It's just wrong. Instead of putting our disabled and elderly communities at the lowest and bottom of our totem pole, we should Put them at our highest. We should continue to fight. We need better. We deserve better. Thank you. Thank you, Ralph. Um, appreciate you and um, honored to, to know you, call you a friend. And we're going to uh, just want to transition uh, here for a minute, and then we'll be able to come back with with questions. I'm sure folks have questions for you. Um, now, Adam Jacobs, uh, I mentioned at the top of uh, this this call, uh, has worked with I've worked with since 2019, spring of 2019, looking at the conservation programs that CPS Energy hosts, and I've learned a lot through that conversation with him. Um, we don't, we hear a lot about the programs here and we're proud of them. Um, we also understand that certainly the critical care program is not one that I was talking about or thinking about in the spring of 19. Um, and it takes on a whole new, like now, you know, we're like, you know, like targeting in on that. Um, but also just in the, the landscape of utilities around the country, 
um, I think of the top 52, I was looking at a document with Adam getting ready for this call, we're like 33. Um, and as much as CPS uh, CEO Paul Gold Williams has been saying, you know, like for, for months, this has been a drumbeat, you know, and I want to I want to share a little bit about this before before for Adam comes on. But for months, there's been kind of like a drumbeat of, you know, energy efficiency costs too much or we can't go too far with conservation uh, in the same way that uh, the this coal retirement uh, resource plan came out. I mean, there's like, it's kind of almost an intentionally poisoning of, of the well there. And I did want to share something. I was looking at this. Um, this is a chart. I don't think this is an Adams uh, presentation uh, that came up a very similar chart like this came up for probably the fast past six or seven months. Uh, and what it is suggesting is that, and I think on one month, it actually said San Antonio could become the most expensive energy market in, um, in, in the state or among the large cities in the state. Uh, and, and we've been asking, you know, well, what is this, you know, what is this gray bar, you know, that puts us up so high? What, where does that come from? Um, and I know that, that we in the kind of advocacy community have asked, you know, what's the, what are the numbers behind that? I know that I heard in one meeting, the mayor asked uh, Gold Williams, you know, what are the numbers behind this bar? And it's just like, all of a sudden you go from the most affordable utility uh, among these, and it's debatable, Austin and San Antonio, of course, you know, right, um, to the most expensive. Um, and what ended up happening, so, so that was part of kind of like this, the seeding of kind of like a, of a skepticism about conservation. There's a series of, of three slides actually that were used and this was just one of them. Um, and so I think what we wanna show one is that these numbers are wrong. They, that, that, that Paul Gold Williams has been promoting a vision of step, a vision of conservation that's out of line with the utilities own experience, the experience of our city and the, the presentations of her staff. Um, and in fact, uh, we have a lot more we can get out of these programs um, just on dollars alone. Um, if we, we want to take this, the morality of this out of the picture. Um, and so the, the, the other thing I think that I think I, I, I want to drop into the same kind of like this, this idea of poisoning of the well is this uh, resource plan. So part of what we've been struggling with and we've been putting forward these, these pillars within the, the, our open letter around closing spruce. And in the same way that the petition in San Antonio was, we want to make sure spruce closes by 2030, you know, that's when we need international commitments, they need to be on this steep, steep slope going down, we need half half of our emissions, you know, zeroed out. Um, so we finally get this report back about coal. Uh, and two things, one is that this chart is explained and the explanation for that big bar is that it's for discussion purposes only. So it's not based on anything, actually. Uh, it's for discussion purposes. So that was a big kind of like, you know, thanks, you know, uh, in, 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 in retrospect. The other thing about that report that I just want to drop in because it comes up in the media, particularly in Express News a lot, is it's going to cost us $12 a month more, you know, each of us, each bill, each month, if we close our coal plant early. Well, what the plan actually says, that is $12, are if we close both coal units in 2023, in two years. Our campaign, the campaign of the petition, are by 2030. So the language is going out, continues to go out, that we're going to be the, you know, the most expensive you know, utility in the state, uh, that $12 per month is like the, the drumbeat in, in the newspaper. Uh, we point out these errors, and it's, you know, it's just we continue to, to see um, uh, trouble here. So I wanted to bring that to folks' attention. And, and you know, Adam, with Optimal Energy, this is a group that they do efficiency. They do uh, offer energy policy experts, you know, to, to, to um, clients around, around the country. Uh, we've worked with him. And I know that in, in this case, as Adam will describe, there are there's so many benefits that come to energy conservation, uh, weatherization, um, and, and the like. And, and number one of all is, is just, it, it saves lives. You know, having an insulated home or an uninsulated home uh, can save a life. And we, we see that in the, what we can expect. You know, I think it was on a, a call recently when the county judge or 
I believe it was on one of these COVID calls. Oh, it'll be another 10 years before we see this, you know, a blackout, cold conditions, whatever. We can expect that this summer again will be scorching hot, that our temperatures will continue to rise thanks to global warming. We know we've seen this pattern for decades, you know. And so when we talk about weatherization, insulation, demand response, solar, all this, really, probably in most cases, we should be thinking about extreme heat scenarios. But, but at both ends of the spectrum, obviously. And so we can, you know, the, we know that for individuals, you know, we've been driving down, much like SAWS likes to talk about, they've been driving down amount of, the amount of water people use through conservation programs. Uh, the average residential use has gone down by 1700 kilowatt hours per year. It's been really impressive and, and it's paying off. And so what I wanted to do and it is just to really let Adam take it from here uh, and describe, um, you know, what, where his re research has taken him. I will say, to, just for the sake of transparency, also and to kind of close the loop on this, CPS came out with their STEP program, you know, uh, or this renewal of, of the STEP program called Flex Step. Uh, and two days later, we came back sort of with, with our response. And so uh, I wanted to just kind of put this out there for folks, you know, that, that where we are with this is that, you know, Yuri was this massive wake up call. This was this, this is a, a time to stop and dig in and find the best of the best that we can. We believe that energy conservation, weatherization, targeting long um, uh, uh, disempowered and neglected communities in San Antonio, making resiliency centers and putting them into these areas. This is how we're gonna save lives. This is how we're gonna get through um, you know, the, 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 the increase of extreme weather uh, that we're uh, in for. And so this is just a couple notes that we did call on them to retract that flex step, the RFP that went out. Um, that may not be possible, but we know that when they do get bids in for some of these uh, issues that we need them to be much more uh, robust than what we've seen uh, in the past. So with that, I'd like to uh, bring, um, Adam on and I'm going to mute my mic and um, and let you take over. Great. Well, thank you so much for having me, Greg, and, and thank you, Ralph, for your your story. I think that's very very instructive and puts a you know a, a face to the experience that you know a lot of people are, are are going through and have gone through in the past couple of months. And and like Greg mentioned, you know we've been looking at. The step program and energy conservation uh, in San Antonio and CPS for for quite a while. So I think um, you know it's all just kind of stacked on top of each other, and it's issue after issue. But you know, the the great thing about energy efficiency, and and I'll get into this later, is that there are so many benefits in addition to the pure cost savings opportunity that are um, you know just intrinsic with how conservation works, and and the the very real tangible infrastructure benefits that come from investments in conservation that, um, you know, you just don't get by building more power plants, frankly. So I will uh, start up this presentation here and hopefully I'll be able to see it. Um, one second here, I'm just gonna share the screen. All right, so hopefully you can see this and maybe Greg, you can let me know just before I launch into it. <laughs> if, uh, if you can see everything yeah. here. Yeah, I do. Fantastic, thank you. So, um, you know, basically, uh, as Greg has mentioned, you know, this is about building back from a disaster and and energy conservation, as as alluded to, um, it certainly saves money, but in in a lot of instances, especially this one, it, it has the potential to save lives. So, just a quick introduction of myself, um, you know, Optimal Energy is a firm that provides, you know, energy uh, consulting and, and policy uh, recommendations to state and local governments. And we also do quite a bit of work with the advocate community because you know, we all believe in the mission and, and the uh, objective of, of fighting climate change and making the planet more resilient. Is that a picture of me sitting over here? Actually, not in Texas. I know it looks like it based on the, the weather you all are experiencing, but uh, <laughs> Um, that's, uh, you know, a, a, an environment that I'm you know, maybe a, a little bit more uh, accustomed to. And unfortunately, you all had to deal with a, a spat of uh, rough winter weather. Um, the agenda that I'll roughly walk through here is to uh, talk about efficiency as a resource uh, for both utility purposes, but also public policy. Uh, I'll talk about the costs and benefits of efficiency to ratepayers. 
those are customers of CPS, as well as CPS Energy itself. There are also benefits for the utility. And then I'll definitely you know, spend quite a bit of time getting into these other benefits of, of energy efficiency and conservation efforts that support disaster recovery. So I want to first start by pointing to some of uh, CPS's comments on, on the, the STEP program or, or FLEX STEP as they're referring to it here. And, and um, you know, like Greg mentioned, you know, the, the program overall, you know, is something to be supportive of. Um, conservation has delivered a lot of great benefits to residents and businesses of San Antonio. But uh, one thing that caught, you know, caught me off guard and, and seemed a little bit just strange is um, this reference from CPS Energy's Flexible Path Resource Plan that was released uh, earlier this year, just before this winter storm. Um, and it referred to conservation as the, the fifth fuel in their arsenal. And they're, they're referring to fifth fuel as, you know, there are a number of other resources they, they look to for power generation and conservation is, is fifth on that list. Um, I have heard of energy conservation referred to in some sort of sequence or hierarchy, but traditionally what I have heard it referred to as someone who works as a you know, energy conservation professional and works in the utility world um, for really my entire career is energy efficiency is, uh, is actually referred to as the, the first fuel. Um, it should be the, the, the first line of defense. So um, this is a, you know, a, a term that is thrown around by the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy. Uh, you know, it's still the first fuel and uh, even looking at utility programs, um, energy conservation routinely comes up as, as the most uh, economically viable way to meet people's needs. Um, the most cost effective and cheapest kilowatt hour is the one that you don't need to use in the first place. Um, and, and, you know, the internet, this is not just the United States, the International Energy Agency uh, widely acknowledges that, you know, efficiency should be the first fuel in economic development and that it leads to you know, more comfortable lives and, and lower energy bills. So um, there's, there's obviously you know, uh, plenty of co-benefits. And what I wanted to show here is just a, a comparison. You know, when we say first fuel, and we say that it's the most cost-effective fuel, this is, um, this is a, a, a look at all the different resources that a, a utility can use to provide power for people. And you'll see a number of different resources, wind, natural gas, you know, uh, uh, utility scale, solar, coal. But at the far left end, if you look at the, the, the um, levelized cost of energy, uh, conservation programs or the, the cost to deliver energy savings, which means um, dollars spent on conservation are vastly more cost effective and cheaper than most other alternatives. So certainly more so than, than coal, especially older coal and retrofitting older coal is much more expensive than energy conservation. Um, and even a lot of natural gas, which is you know, a fairly cheap fuel, is very abundant in Texas. Um, energy conservation is still routinely comes out as the most cost-effective way to uh, provide the resources that people need. Um, again, the, the most, the, the cheapest uh, fuel is the one that you don't need to use in the first place. Um, and so this, this gets us back to sort of what CPS has put forward. And, and I've seen this come up in a few different presentations and they call this um, a, a bill impact. Um, you know, this is what a, a resident or a, a, a residential electric customer might see and what they would pay uh, in conservation charges. And now, you know, when I've seen these, you know, bill impacts done before, you typically account for, yes, the cost of, of collecting the, the, you know, conservation fee that funds these efficiency programs that CPS will deliver. Um, but those usually come hand in hand with an accounting of the benefits of the program. Um, you know, unlike paying for a, a power plant or paying for, um, you know, transmission equipment, uh, those are, those are hard assets that, you know, don't result in a direct reduction in customers' bills. So it's, it's kind of strange to see how this is, you know, put forward as something that, you know, there are funds that need to be collected, but there's no accounting for the, you know, what those funds go to and what they, what they actually deliver. 
but in um, subsequent conversations with CPS, you know, we asked about this. We wanted to get more information about, you know, the, the benefit side of the equation. You know, if you're doing a, a cost benefit analysis, you want to account for, yes, the costs, this $44, um, but also the benefits. And what we saw in the flex uh, path resource plan, and this is again, just straight from CPS's uh, uh, you know, report that they issued back in January, is that, you know, according to CPS, as a result of the STEP program, residential use per bill has consistently dropped since 2009, which is when the program began. That reduction of, of uh, 1,750 kilowatt hours is about a 12% reduction on average for, for customers' bills. And, um, you know, I guess another part of this is sort of, you know, in order to get the benefits of, of conservation, you have to participate in, in the programs. And, you know, there's some concern about maybe um, people who are paying this $44, but not getting the benefits out of the program. Um, frankly, that's, that's, a, that's a program design issue. And there are a lot of very intelligent people that do very good work in trying to optimize programs to make sure that people participate. But looking at CPS's, again, their customer participation um, in fiscal year 2018, and this is the, the, the statistic they cite, about a third of their customers participated in the program. And while that might not seem like a lot, most energy conservation measures last much longer than three years. In fact, I think the average um, uh, uh, measure life or, or the duration of the, the benefits of, of an energy conservation measure, be it a LED light bulb or a better weatherized home, most of those benefits last 10 years or, or, or longer. So as, if you're getting to a third of your customers on an annual basis, um, every three years, you're, you're essentially serving all San Antonians and they're receiving those benefits for, for many years you know, uh, after they make their investment in conservation. So customers are saving energy. Um, they are participating in programs and while CPS, you know, was focused on that $44 of, of cost, they didn't necessarily calculate out what the benefits of that would be. So taking that 1700 uh, kilowatt hour reduction and applying that to the rates that customers pay, you'll see that while they're paying $44 in, in conservation costs, and, and again, as Greg mentioned, there's been a lot of focus on the cost of conservation and how it can't be too expensive and we don't want to go too far with it. Um, by CPS's own math, you know, the average customer should be saving about $187 every year for that $44 they're investing. Um, so on net, they're coming out, you know, 143 bucks in, in the green there. And that's, that's about four times the benefits of, of um, you know, the cost that they're paying. And, you know, typically when you have something that's so beneficial where the costs vastly exceed uh, or the benefits vastly exceed the costs by this degree, um, you, you want to, you know, invest as much as you possibly can in that. You know, if you, can, if you can get four times the benefits out of an investment, then ideally you would be ramping up step and you would be doubling down on conservation. And that's a, a purely financial argument. But if you look at the, the numbers CPS has put out here, um, we are showing that if you count account for the costs and the benefits of STEP, that customers are saving energy and they are coming out, you know, far ahead of where they would have in the absence of the programs. Um, I think there's a, a healthy discussion to be had about making sure that there is robust program participation. Um, I think they have shown a, a increasing trend over time in people participating in STEP as they do better marketing and get out to customers. Um, I'll also note that many of the low income programs or, or um, you know, income eligible programs come at no cost to the, the, the customer themselves. So, um, you know, efficiency programs generally do a pretty good job of serving um, low and income qualified customers. Um, and I think with a ro more robust outreach strategy, which there are countless examples of how to do so from other utility energy efficiency programs around the country. Like Greg mentioned, CPS is ranked 33 out of the 52 largest utility programs. Um, there are lessons to be learned to make sure that people are participating and that you know, more and more people are getting this $143 in benefit rather than just receiving that $44 in, in costs. So um, 
you know, that in itself should probably be enough to justify going ahead and, and you know, implementing a more robust step program. But like I said, there are all these non uh, energy and non financial benefits that come along with energy conservation. And this is a heavily researched topic. A lot more, you know, people put a lot of time and, and effort into various components of it. And this is a great graphic that just really shows the, the level of benefits that accrue and, and what, you know, CPS customers are really getting for their $44 in addition to bill savings. Um, I'm going to touch on some of these but there are extensive papers written on each individual one of these that you know in and of itself should be sufficient to, to really make a strong case for energy conservation so i'll start with one that you know is certainly uh, uh relevant to the discussion today and that energy efficiency and health are very closely tied together um there was a, a really great at a town hall that we did back in august and, and greg can share info on this uh, a presenter um, who worked in the healthcare industry in San Antonio, and she had a lot of very useful information and insights on, on the negative impacts of air pollution and the on the flip side, the benefits of energy conservation and that it reduces air pollution from burning coal and other fossil fuels. Um, but that, that's focusing on you know just the generation impacts and doesn't even touch on the fact that you know in, in this specific instance that you had with winter storm, you know Uri, there were, there were pretty direct health consequences for those who did not have properly weatherized homes. And, and I'll, I'll come back to that one in a moment, but you know, this is, um, there's a link here and we can, we can send it out after the fact if you're interested, but there, you know, this is an example study by the Physicians for Social Responsibility. It's an organization that has been very involved in, in climate action from a health perspective understanding that a lot of the most vulnerable people are going to be the ones who are most susceptible and most at risk to uh, the impacts of climate change. So, um, you know, there are very legitimate health benefits that, that can certainly, um, you know, be another, you know, arrow in the quiver of why energy conservation is, is a good, good deal for, um, you know, everyone, much less, you know, just uh, any individual customer. Also point to, um, the job benefits of energy conservation. And this is a, a study that was uh, issued just uh, about a year ago. And this looks at the um, uh, employment from energy conservation in America. And they did these, these you know, state by state uh, views. And there's a little fact sheet for Texas here linked below. And they identified 162,000 or over 162,000 total jobs in energy conservation in the state of Texas. And if you look at the subregion uh, information, that includes about 12,000 or just under 13,000 people in the San Antonio metro area who are employed in the energy conservation industry. And that can be, you know, HVAC, so heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. Um, it can be in building and construction and insulation and a number of other areas that, you know, have to do with um, uh, efficiency program delivery. And, and just another really great statistic I saw out of this report is that, you know, when we talk about the employment benefits and certainly, you know, in this, you know, last year that we've all experienced with COVID where small businesses are really just taking a hit. Um, energy conservation, particularly, again, from this Texas report is delivered mostly by small businesses. You'll see that, you know, just looking at these two bottom tracks here, that's over 80% of the firms that deliver energy efficiency in Texas are under 19 employees. These are very small businesses, even micro businesses that are delivering conservation services. So we're not talking about huge, you know, uh, conglomerate, you know, in, um, you know, international or multinational firms. These are small mom and pop businesses that are out there weatherizing homes, installing efficient lighting systems, upgrading HVAC systems, um, and, and delivering benefits to, to San Antonians. When we talk about utility burden, um, this is this is from a, a, a report that is put out by again the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy, and and they have done a number of studies in the last several years, looking at the energy burden that uh, low income and other disadvantaged communities experience, and what they find is that routinely um, non-white households and low income households 
spend a significantly higher portion of their household income on utilities. And in, I believe Greg and I were looking at this earlier today, the, the statistics, again, specific to San Antonio was that something along the lines of one in five uh, low income residents spends over a quarter of their, their household income on utilities. Now, if you think the $44 is what's really breaking the bank, I, I just really don't know what to tell you there. I, I don't think it's the $44. I think it's, <laughs> it's the, you know, the high usage, because if we're talking about a uh, customer that's using, you know, 13,000 kilowatt hours a year, that $44 is, you know, not the thing that's pushing them over the top. It's the overall using too much energy in the first place or not having a well-insulated home or not having an efficient air conditioning system that is, you know, driving higher consumption rates and, and really costing them a lot more on a monthly basis. So to reduce the economic hardship and reduce the strain on people's household budgets that are just trying to make ends meet, you know, energy conservation, like I showed before, you know, it's paying back fourfold. So I, I don't think it's, it's proper to look at it just as a cost and not account for the very real benefits that, that those customers are receiving, especially when we know that they are most uh, heavily impacting, uh, you know, low income populations of color. And this one just, you know, says it all and should really, you know, hammer it home. Um, the value of energy conservation in the event of an outage is just purely the experience Ralph described, you know, he's putting up blankets and, and towels by the door to, to keep the heat inside. Um, this is a, a graphic from the US Department of Energy, and they highlight the value of energy efficiency and on site generation uh, in the event of um, normal, you know, grid power operations in that, you know, it can reduce spikes for demand, it can reduce people's costs, can provide greater comfort and better indoor air quality. But in the event of an outage, this term, passive survivability, this is, this is one I wanna really just drill into here. So the US Department of Energy talks about passive survivability. And, and what that is, is the, abil the ability of a building to maintain habitable conditions in the event of heating and cooling system loss. So what you'll see on the right is a picture of a weatherized home, a properly insulated home. And in the event of an outage, this home is going to maintain its space temperature, whether that is in a winter outage where heating is critical or in a summer emergency where cooling is critical. This home will maintain the temperature that is comfortable to the occupants and safe and habitable much greater than an uninsulated home. So, you know, we've gone through a, a litany of reasons or a, a, a long range of reasons as to why energy conservation is a beneficial, um, you know, investment for CPS Energy and for San Antonians. And this one really should just, just, you know, be very clear that in the event that you all experienced in, in winter storm uh, area, that if you had a lot more homes and businesses that had this kind of insulation, one, you know, the, the spaces would be more habitable for a longer period of time, would give you more time for the power to come back on and buy you that precious time until you, you know, are able to get yourself uh, into a, a safer environment. Um, you wouldn't have the, the burst pipes that, you know, plagued a lot of places and resulted in a lot of water damage if those were properly insulated. Um, so, you know, these are, these are things that just should make perfect sense. It's, it's, Frankly, it's physics, you know, <laughs> you need to keep the heat in and you need to keep the heat out depending on what, what season it is. So, you know, better insulated and more efficient homes stay warm in the winter and cool in the summer. Um, if, you know, the Department of Energy isn't enough to convince you, you know, I, I, I don't know what would be. So I talked a lot about what customers get out of, out of the STEP program and out of energy conservation, but I thought it would be worth you know, rounding this out with, um, you know, an understanding of, of what's in it for CPS. So this is a little bit, you know, down in the weeds, but essentially this is, you know, CPS is the program administrator. They run the STEP program and they, in their own reports, which is again, linked down here, um, show the, the benefit cost ratio of their programs to basically compare the benefits of the program 
which are the avoided energy and capacity uh, costs. So that's the avoided power generation and the avoided infrastructure that they have to build out. And they compare that to the incentives that they need to pay out to customers to, to fund conservation programs and their administrative costs. And now over the course of uh, the latest program year, fiscal year 20, even for CPS, this program delivers more than twice the benefits of the costs that it, it takes for them to operate the programs. So you've got you know, a long list of, of reasons why energy conservation is good for customers. And you know, frankly, when we get down to it, it's good for CPS energy. They are avoiding expensive investments in power generation that is subject to fuel price spikes, to extreme weather, to all sorts of market fluctuations that they don't have control over. If the cost of gas or the cost of coal goes up dramatically, or you know, there's a, a, a spike in demand and suddenly supply costs go up dramatically, um, you're set, you're stuck with this fixed asset that you've invested in, you know, maybe decades ago. And that doesn't that doesn't happen with energy conservation. You have uh, a hard asset that is in someone's home. It is an improved, more insulated, healthier building for them to live or work in. If we're talking about small businesses, and you know, it, it should just be a no-brainer. So I'll I'll basically close it here with a slide that I shared back at um, the the town hall event that we had back in August, where we talked about how FlexStep, which is CPS Energy's proposed, you know, uh, name for their next 10 year energy conservation program, where FlexStep could bring San Antonio in your goals to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And this is a chart from the city of San Antonio's uh, climate action plan. It's looking at the latest year, uh, there's probably another year actually at this point um, of, of greenhouse gas emissions. And it's looking at the, traje the trajectory of where we're trying to be in order to reduce emissions down to a 2050 goal. And based on a aggressive, but very achievable conservation program that includes the traditional efficiency measures, as well as the energy storage and solar and demand response programs that CPS Energy runs, if they were to you know, go for a more comprehensive and more robust program than what is currently being proposed, we could keep you well on track to meeting that 2030 interim goal and set you up for, for a much better position for the, the subsequent two decades, which will be really the very difficult ones. And, and what I started this presentation with was that energy conservation is, is the first fuel. And the reason it's the first fuel is that all you're trying to do with all of your other you know, generation decisions, all the power plants that you wanna build, you're building up that supply so that you can meet the demand. And in order to make sure that you're not overbuilding, that you're not creating more power generation than is needed, the first thing that you're supposed to do is to reduce your demand as much as possible so that whatever eventual system, be it solar, wind, or battery storage, or any combination of those things, can be as minimal as possible so that you're not building, you know, uh, large, large amounts of, of excess generation. Um, and again, you know, that's, that's totally leaving aside all of the points around the fact that, you know, energy conservation delivers health benefits, it delivers uh, economic benefits in the form of jobs and economic development. Um, it makes buildings uh, more resilient to extreme weather events. And we know that those resilience features are most important to the most disadvantaged communities among us. So again, I'll just, I'll leave it there, but I, I just see no way that energy conservation should not be the first line of defense in all things related to providing a uh, just and equitable climate future for San Antonio. So thank yeah. you for your time. Thank, thank you, Adam. Um, you may need to mute. Um, um, if you don't mind checking the chat, there's a kind of a lengthy question in there for you. Sure. Just, so if you'll check that. And, and I just want to say, you know, that this is something that, you know, going back to our original letter, you know, around energy conservation. I mean, this is a, the vision that, that I think many of us have been carrying is for a program that 
uh, you know, the, the, the parts of it that we like, we want to see driven into communities that have been, you know, um, um, disempowered and neglected, ignored for, for, for a long, long time that make making, we talk about energy burden that, that are paying more for energy, but are also more vulnerable to, to dying, you know, in an ice storm because they're, those homes are not weatherized because they don't have access to uh, a, a, a heated, a heat, a heat center or a cooling station or what, what have you. Um, and so what I really hope it, it, it will come out of this, if we can kind of continue to, to collaborate and build a vision together is, is that we take an opportunity motivated by this disaster, motivated by this pandemic, motivated by you know the fat, very fact that we're moving into to, to this increasing pace of, of extreme uh, climate events to, to really look at a citywide movement of weatherization conservation that we're spinning out, not just within, C we don't want it to be held by CPS, we want it to be held by the people of San Antonio that we're using the, the tools that CPS has and expertise that lives there with other city departments, potentially with other organizations and, and making those, uh, doing skill shares, doing jobs trainings, bringing you know, decentralized solar and, and hopefully uh, resiliency centers so that we can use, I think it was on the, I'm sorry, uh, Seba, that was terrible. For our, our Spanish translation, that was a lot. Um, let's slow down for a second. Um, just to say that the opportunities are huge. These programs are not only neglected in public dialogue, but they're ignored. Um, our elected leaders, uh, responded that they didn't respond to our original report on the potential of, uh, of, of these programs last spring. Uh, they didn't respond when we came back in October uh, with a five point plan for, for um, COVID recovery that was built upon this idea that we can build, you know, do this together. Uh, and so we're coming back, you know, we're trying to drill deeper into it and work together um, uh, to move this vision of kind of like a, a, I think a climate conservation core or something. It's an economic tool. It's a, it's a social stability tool. It's, it's, it's something that can save lives. Um, and anyway, I, I, I'll, I'll mute my mic. <laughs> Say buzz in the chat. Thank you. Um, and just a reminder, there is Spanish translation. If you prefer Spanish, it's down at the bottom of the screen. Uh, and we'll be presenting this back, recording and presenting back both an English and a Spanish translation. Um, Adam, if you wanted to respond to that uh, chat, if there's something you can offer. Sure, yeah, so so uh, Carolyn is asking about, you know, uh, a notice she received during a summer uh, heat wave where from 3 to 7 p.m. CPS instructed customers to try and conserve energy by not using uh, very energy intensive appliances. So those sort of voluntary notifications are, you know, uh, they're, they're part of a conservation strategy, but I would say they are ones that don't come with a lot of resources for you, the customers. So um, CPS does have programs that involve, say, for example, um, installing of smart thermostats that can respond automatically to these sort of signals. Um, they also, you know, might have other other mechanisms for reducing your demand during those peak times in the summer when when demand for energy is very high. But you know, I'll also just note that you know, those are those are targeted things for very specific instances when there is uh, high demand on the grid. And while those are you know certainly very important and do do drive. Um, a lot of the reason that power plants and generation capacity is built, um, there are you know there are measures that CPS uh, does support things like weatherization and, and when I say weatherization that's a a, a broad category that refers to insulating, um, air sealing, uh, ensuring that you have uh, adequate uh, or, or good. Uh, ductwork insulation if your home has uh, any sort of central heating system or even just providing support uh, in terms of incentives and uh, rebates for more efficient air conditioners if you have window units. So those are the sort of things that, you know, in addition to these peak times, um, you know, where they're trying to get people to implement specific behaviors, um, they, can, they can provide support for things that provide a, a reduction in usage all the time. So that helps with this 3 to 7 p.m. issue. And it also helps, you know, 
when there's not a grid emergency. And that's you know, also you know, kind of baked into how these programs operate. I want to add a note where you can actually apartments and condos. I will say um, thanks for that, Justin. Um, when, earlier in the call, we were talking about how we'd been kind of negotiating. I don't know if that's the right term when you work with deal with CPS, but we had been, been involved in the several phone calls or Zoom calls, uh, Adam and I and Cyrus Reed, um, about the current proposal that's been put out to the market for another round of, of these kinds of programs. And that was the one thing that we got done is that they agreed that they were going to make it available to apartments and condominiums and that sort of thing. So, um, so I will say there were there were there were there were moderate incre kind of incremental type improvements that were done. Their their overall goals were were lifted up a little bit, and then and that was the other win, right? Um, but the reason we've come back and and we're we're kind of pushing back on them is that in light of the crisis we just lived through, the majority of us lived through. We you know we don't know how many people are still in their homes to be um, uh, uh, discovered. Um, that it was time to do a deeper dive and drill into this and look for you know the maximum uh, return we could get. So um, yeah, good good comment, Adam. Yeah, Greg, I'd love to touch on that one briefly. Um, apartments and condos, particularly uh, in multifamily, they they can be um, a little challenging in that you might have a landlord that owns the space and a tenant who pays the utility bill. And there have been a, a lot of, you know, really creative thoughts on how to get at um, what they call a, a split incentive where the landlord might pay for insulating the property and the tenant actually benefits from it in the form of reduced uh, utility charges. And the reason why it's so important for energy conservation programs to focus on multifamily buildings is because in the absence of incentives and rebates, there's not a lot of motivation for a landlord to insulate and weatherize that, that apartment unit. So, you know, maybe they can charge a, a higher rent. I, I would hope that's not what it comes to, but you know, if you're a landlord and you have a cost of insulating a building, you may pass that cost on. But if CPS Energy is running a program that offers you know, very lucrative incentives or, or rebates for, for insulation. And, and we do find typically that um, when there are multifamily programs that do try and get at those apartment buildings and condos, they offer almost complete cost coverage for the insulation. Um, that is, that is a, a really beneficial thing there. So I'm glad that you mentioned it. And I think it's, you know, especially in multifamily housing, um, it's really important to, to have those incentives in place to get landlords who might not otherwise have motivation to, to go out and make those building improvements. You really need a structured program that offers them uh, financial support to do so. So it's a, it's a great question, Justin. Yeah, and I, one other thing I would add is that also kind of fits into the Climate Action Plan development in that it was originally, I think the language was originally to require benchmarking of energy use uh, for property, for commercial properties. Um, that would have kind of like put a, a little bit more pressure onto landlords and property owners to, you know, potentially, you know, the city could come back and, and, and start looking at them more closely. So uh, right now it's a voluntary program, I think, to benchmark energy use, but, uh, but that's another area to look for possible changes in the future. I don't know if there's other, other questions or comments at this point. And I don't know if Ralph, if you want to come on, if you have any uh, parting words either, it's 7.20. Um, a number of folks, I've, I've seen kind of like a number of folks come in that weren't here when you first came on the call. So you could introduce yourself and 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 we can start signing off. Uh, but we'll yeah. watch that. Yeah, for sure. Uh, you know, uh, my point, my comments that I just have to make is that, you know, not only do these, um, so, uh, you know, solar power and, uh, and uh, energy efficient uh, programs that we're, we're trying to get right now, you know, it, it's very important to stress that, you know, with, with a number of things, you know, that CPS is running, like the critical care program, you, you can't 
rely on a critical care program that isn't made to take care of you. And not only that, but it's, you know, it, it's time for change. And with change, it can only become better because when we continue to play the same game over and over again, you're gonna get the same results. So, you know, especially, you know, living in San Antonio, I've seen the ups, I've seen the downs. And so when we take that leap of faith and start doing these things and take action, you're only gonna go up because right now we're at the lowest of the low and we can come back stronger. We can come back better than ever and we can be something that we have been saying for the longest time. I, I, I hear a lot of people say that Texas is great and, you know, it's the Lone Star State, you know, um, adaption is the, is the biggest um, thing, you know, being disabled myself, we take that step, you know, we have to adapt with our disability. And so if we take that step together, we can adapt and we can do something great, not only for the city, but be that example for the rest of the state. I think one of the things that, I mean, I wasn't surprised, um, but uh, in preparing for this call, uh, the analysis that Adam and Optimal were able to do around um, uh, rates and, you know, in these, in these programs was a kind of a side conversation about transparency, I think. And it's, and I guess it was a reminder that, you know, we can build kind of like the, the Sierra Club, you know, released a couple of reports uh, over the last few years uh, about the coal plant and um, what it would cost to retire the coal plant and, you know, that finding, you know, how many millions of dollars were we losing burning coal in San Antonio and what we could expect, you know, in the end to come out with. Uh, and that information is all, you know, based upon what we can get from CPS. And sometimes there's a lot more information that's available uh, through these, you know, the for-profit corporate, you know, entities uh, and I think that may be part of the, the the case here in that, you know, we can take, you know, what what they're telling us in these PowerPoints that, you know, it's costing such amount of money. All of their slides, Paul Gold Williams has been sharing is like, oh, how much, you know, conservation costs. I'm not hearing anything back on like what they're making uh, off of it or how it's bettering the community or, you know, uh, the positives, right, the benefits um, until you get deep into report like the resource plan that came out recently. Um, so I do, I do want to add on to that, but I want to welcome um, also and just let people know, uh, Sebai Lee, a friend of ours, has been diligently interpreting uh, this whole call. Uh, it's going on uh, a minute and 25. Uh, we've been on quite a bit longer than that. Um, but um, uh, here's an, I don't know if you can see this, Ralph, but a nice comment in the Q&A. Um, so anyway, I want to thank Sebo, I want to thank Adam and, and Ralph. Um, let's see, I want to make sure this isn't a question. Thank you. Nice. Okay. So Carolyn sent you a, 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 a thumbs up here. Um, I hope you can see it. Learned so much from you. Thank you for your articulate and enlightening story of your multiple ordeals with CPS. So I'll close there. Uh, as I said earlier in the program, uh, this will be available. We'll be recording this. And the intent here is to look at bills, look at rate reform, look at disconnections and debt, look at um, weatherization programs and efficiency, look at this, this whole suite of, of options we have as a community to transform uh, our, our, our communities through the kind of principles of energy justice and climate justice. So we'll continue on. And um, I think uh, upcoming um, programs will be posted through um, a variety of channels. I'll put if anybody wants to make sure to be alerted. One more for the chat. Um, this is a newsletter. Uh, it's not used often, but I'll commit to emailing folks uh, when the next one of these 
comes on. And then uh, on the creative side of this, you will see those of the, those uh, who carry along with us the final product in, in these campaigns, you know, what we're driving forward with the city. And hopefully we can work across many, 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 many community organizations and find points of, um, of, of, of strong agreement that uh, our utility exists for the people. Um, and we should have the, 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 the power behind it, uh, as well as that the technical uh, ability there to protect our most vulnerable uh, and to grow. So with that, I think I'll, I'll close out. I'm going to close my video and uh, play a little music and we'll, we'll end from there. Let me add um, one. I look, cause that's just because I liked it. <laughs> okay. Thank you everybody.